today we have kind of a dream team of panelists here. It's, uh, it's almost humbling to be here. And uh, I've, I, I've sharing this stage with uh, such luminaries is, is really a treat of a lifetime. The question, of course, is what zoos and aquariums uh, mean and how do they develop these uh, caring attitudes for, for our planet. I'm going to ask uh, in just kind of a very generic way, um, there are major changes happening to society right now. Uh, these uh, uh, roles that we've spoken in our relationship with nature, uh, the caring for the earth, uh, our generational cultural changes. Let me ask by saying, um, particularly to uh, my friends, the practitioners in the zoo world, zoo and aquarium world, what is the role of zoos and aquariums in conservation? What are we doing for the planet these days? Kevin. Thanks, Alejandro. So when, when Sylvia was speaking, she talked about how depressing news can be. And that's especially true for wildlife. If, if you consider in the last year, we lost 100 million sharks to human activities. Uh, every day, we see 96 elephants vanish from the face of the planet. And, and in the coming years, we could lose anywhere from one third to one half of all amphibians. So it's pretty grim stuff. And the good news is that zoos and aquariums historically have been all about saving species. We, we have so many species around, from the American bison to the California condor to the Wyoming toad, that are with us today because of our direct intervention. Uh, last year alone, and, and we're all colleagues and members of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, last year the 230 AZA members uh, contributed $160 million in investment directly in field-based conservation programs to, to save species from going extinct. And, and that's not enough, and we're not content with that. And in fact, we've just recently launched an initiative that we call SAFE, which stands for Saving Animals from Extinction which redoubles our efforts and will bring to bear the collective might of our scientific expertise and our animal husbandry programs. And having said all of that, we have the beautiful advantage of also having a visiting public. And as Courtney mentioned, we've got 180 million people. That's more than visit all the professional sports associations in America coming to zoos and aquariums every year. And do they come for entertainment? Sure. And when I think of entertainment, particularly at our institutions, I think of a shared family experience. People of all ages, grandparents, grandkids, moms, dads, brothers and sisters, having moments of fun, but also something more. They're, they're experiencing an empathy with other species. And the research suggests and shows that that's true for the majority of visitors. They also walk away with a greater sense of connection to nature. So how do we channel that? We know that they already know the issues, despite their political differences or their differing backgrounds. We know that they know things are bad. We know also from research that they're actively looking for our leadership. So we have a tremendous opportunity, um, despite our naysayers, to really harness and channel and create a wildlife movement unlike any other on the planet. And, and we have to because time's running out. Anybody want to add anything? Uh, well, I think this is the core of the question, right? What is our role in conservation? And I guess from my perspective, you know, being involved with an institution that's only 30 years old, and we uh, kind of had a different model, which was to put together a collection of living things to tell a story of conservation in, a, in an ecosystem approach. Uh, we, you know, ha have done a lot of study of, of what happens in institutions like ours, and. The fact of the matter is, um, the zoos and aquariums across the country really are having different impacts. I mean, you have the newer ones like Monterey, and then you have many of our esteemed zoos that have been with us for a long time that were collected, a collection of animals. So I think when I look at the question, my answer is, um, it's a continuum. And uh, toward that end, we have some amazing leadership uh, examples going on. I mean, we don't need to reinvent the wheel in terms of looking at institutions that are having major impact. First of all, there, are, of course, are the institutions that have had remarkable and very impactful field conservation, um, like Chicago Zoological Society and others over time. And then more and more, though, and I think what Jeannie uh, was, was referring to, this question of what are we doing to influence the human, human element that comes through our places. I'm always fond of saying that the hardest part about building an aquarium is not what's on the wet side of the glass, it's what on the dry side, <laughs> us. Um, 
And we're all still learning every day. I'm certainly learning every day. What is it that, uh, what motivates people to come to our institutions? What are they taking from our institutions? And I think, again, as was pointed out, every person that comes in our doors brings with, it, brings with them a different background. And so the answer to that is, is a complex one. But I can say that in all of our institutions, um, I've seen everything from incredible family interactions that are about establishing a culture of caring and environmental values from a very young age and around kids that have never even encountered animals, say a lot of kids um, in urban areas, of course, that don't have access to green space and nature, or even in our community in the beautiful Monterey Bay, there are kids just 15 miles inland that have never seen the ocean. Those kids are changed for life when they get to the seashore and when they get in the aquarium, or for example, when we introduce them to a dive program. Um, so from that continuum, of course, then we have visitors that they want to take action, and many of us are starting to do some things that take it to a much um, greater level, something that uh, Kevin and, and um, our institution and, and others are just launching is a aquarium conservation uh, partnership that will engage a, a, in a collective action model aquariums that are interested in using their influence on behalf of policy change. When it comes to the aquarium, I mean, when it comes to the ocean, no one owns it. So when you think about it, uh, you can't buy it and make it a nice park and lock it away. You have to decide how we're going to responsibly manage and protect the ocean that we all have a stake in for the future and do that together. Let me, let me also ask, uh, Jeannie, you started a, a kind of a, also a very interesting thread, which is this need for education. Um, I think, Sylvia, you also mentioned the, the, the knowledge, whether it's uh, learn in school or, or learn through family interactions or learning as kids talk with their mothers or grandparents talk to their children. Um, there is evidently a role. One of the things that I do when I walk in zoos is not watch the animals because I know the animals pretty well, but I actually pay more attention to the people and the interactions that happen among those people. Um, there is a clear role for science and education. How can we really turn that into action? How can we turn that into policy? What kinds of roles can zoos and aquariums have in terms of bringing higher level of knowledge and passion for the natural world. Anybody? It's probably antithetical. It might be antithetical to say this, but I'm not sure that that's the thing that we're best at. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly uh, there are a lot of people looking at uh, what happens when people experience a zoo and aquarium and say, oh my goodness, you know, there's, there's a there's a possibility that there's permanent lasting behavior change that results from that. I'm flattered when they do. It's just a little hard for me to imagine how two hours in a zoo can really change you for life. But all it does, you, you, you spent an hour in front of an aquarium and you, you became something very special. Uh, and then we look at that formal education model and, you know, the, the learning, the factual material and, and how that becomes, you know, ideas and, and become concepts and in turn become paradigms. That's all very, very important. But I think what really happens, it's wonderful, is that people fall in love. So you hear them. Wow, look at that giraffe. It's got an incredible neck and a 14 inch tongue. I love giraffe. And you hear that all the time as you go around the zoo. And, and the unfortunate thing is that we don't understand it very well. We don't understand what happens. Uh, you think about it, love is the most powerful force in our lives. But let me look out here over the audience and, and ask how many of you aced Love 101? <laughs> Not very many. Probably because none of you took it, because we don't, we don't have it in universities. Most powerful force on the planet from a social point of view, we don't have it in universities. So how can we really understand what happens when people are going around the zoo and falling in love? And I, I think that that's where the long-term behavioral change comes in. It's not like somebody sees something and then goes out and says, well, I better start recycling. I think what happens is people fall in love a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more. And that's what ultimately changes people. Not, and it's, it's, so it's not very specific, it's much more general. I think much more profound. So we're romancing people. <laughs> I think that's a very interesting metaphor because we easily fall into the idea of getting to know things better, but really getting to love, love things better, it's a, it's a higher question in a sense. Sylvia. I think you've hit on something truly important. It's getting people to care. You know, it's one thing to intellectualize we got to take care of the natural world because our life depends on it, because whatever. But 
there's something beyond that, that once you see the, co the connection back to you, it, it transcends facts and figures. It just means you're motivated in a different way. I, I do think that in addition to that personal connection, having a grouper look at you, you know, not just a grouper swimming around, but he's come over and he's looked at, he's looking at you, he's looking at me, and somehow there's a connection that, unless it, a picture doesn't do it, although pictures are great, and we need all of these wonderful natural history films and so on, but it's that, or the touch tank idea that has been so powerful at the Monterey Aquarium and other aquarias as well. Well, you need to think about the standpoint of the rays and the starfish. <laughs> so I keep in my head this thought about you should, huh, should do unto fish as you would have fish do unto, the, unto you, <laughs> or a starfish, or a, an elephant, or anything. You, I, it, but you can create that empathy if you actually are there with the living creatures. If you see an elephant chained by its foot, and you just imagine what it's like to be an elephant in that position, it, it's pretty strong stuff. And even when you hear stories about it or see images of it, but actually to see something that's really right or really wrong, it's that emotional connection that makes a difference. I think the best zoos and aquariums are staffed by people who can, in a way, get in the skin of the elephants or to think like a fish. Uh, David Powell, who was at the Monterey Aquarium for so, such a long time. Anyway, I, I, I think he thought it was a compliment when I told him that I charged him with thinking like a fish. It's a, uh, are you a Racanelli? Where are you? Yeah, you think like a fish. <laughs> and that's a good thing. We all need to think, it put ourselves in the place of the other creatures and then, you know, take it from there. Do unto them as you want to be done unto, <laughs> and uh, and it works. Thank you, um, Scott. You you presented some pretty alarming graphs about changing in culture and changing in trends, uh, both about um, how we interpret whether animals are happy or not. What is happiness? I think that's a valid question. But um, in a sense, also some of that we have just discussed. How do you? instill that sense of connection when we're spending so much time in front of a screen? How do you transfer the idea of, of staring at a grouper or staring at a giraffe and smelling that giraffe and actually hearing it click and hearing the breathing? How, how do we see that, that future? That's a huge challenge we have ahead of us. It is, and, and I was really struck by one of Sylvia's comments. I don't necessarily view, and I think part of what our role is, is to be a, a voice for the marketplace. Less opinion makers, but really quantify what public perceptions are. And Sylvia, you had this great comment about, I don't think we're competing with technology. I think at our best, technology enables profound levels of access and understanding and recommunication ability. It's, it's, it's how we tell our stories and how we enable and empower other people to tell stories on our behalf. One of the, the first project we ever did with a nonprofit organization was when I met Julie about 10 or 11 years ago. And she asked a number of very big questions. Uh, the first was she wanted to understand better all the audiences of the future, not just her current audiences, but the entire market potential. <laughs> Everyone who wasn't currently engaging with the Modern Bay Aquarium or aquariums overall to understand what is the means of accessing them. And then she posed a really interesting question. She said, every day I want to challenge myself and everyone in the sector to, under, to, to respond to, should we be more than an aquarium, more of an aquarium, or reimagine what an aquarium should be to better serve our audiences? And what I think we're at this crossroads now is, is we look at technology and the role, and we've kind of thought of it as a competitor. I think a lot of the market's saying, but it's an enabler. It's not a competitor. And what we want from you is, is actually additional content to help, to help better inform our decisions. It's okay to be inspirational. It's in, it, actually, it's amazing to be inspirational. It's also okay to be prescriptive. I think the market understands how important these topics are, 
And as trust in other enterprise or agencies or things that are perceived to be politically partisan has eroded, aquariums and zoos have this amazing role now of, of authority. And because it's so important, they want us to leverage technology to communicate what they should be doing. How do we act in the planet's interest? How do we make a meaningful impact? And the places that do it are extraordinarily relevant. Are, you can't imagine California without the Monterey Bay Aquarium. You can't imagine the future of California without the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Other places that could achieve that impact would, would resolve automatically the question of what roles our organizations have. Can I make one quick yes, comment? Please. That in the introductory remarks about um, do we really need zoos and aquariums? Can virtual reality take the place of the real deal? Well, I believe the present company generally is of a mind that there's nothing like the real thing and <laughs> the, or no substitute for being there and the ability to touch and interact with, with, a, <laughs> with living things. And yet, here's the thing, most of life on Earth is really small. And I love that wall at the Monterey Aquarium of plankton that is, it's, it's not the real deal, but they're real pictures of the real deal. And when you touch them, they explode into a size that a human can relate to. So why don't people care about Prochlorococcus? Because <laughs> it's so tiny. And it took you know, gazillions of years before we got to the point with technology of understanding why it matters or even to be able to find it. And then to realize why it's so important. So I just came back from a TED conference in Vancouver and I had the opportunity to go through the best of the, I tried many virtual experiences, wearing head gear and all that, imagining that you're on Mars or whatever, but in this case, it was a simulation of an archeological site. It's an organization that's based in Salt Lake City and it's called Void. And it, I don't know, what happened was, I went through it and I was impressed. It, it looked like the, the setting from, uh, Indiana Jones scene, and as I emerged, there was Harrison Ford ready to go in to see it for himself. <laughs> and he emerged with, yeah, you know, it was okay. <laughs> what I see is, why not embrace these technologies as a competitive either or, but how can you enhance the experience of diving into the deep sea or to see plankton that you become a piece of a little critter that is swimming around and you become diminutive, or maybe you can imagine yourself as a whale. You can actually get into it and feel the motion as you swim through. I mean, there are ways that now, looking forward 50 years, that we can barely imagine. It can be wildly entertaining, but also really enable us to see what we have such a hard time grasping unless we actually do jump into the ocean or do fly high in the sky or do use microscopes and telescopes to transport us there. I, I think that we're right on the edge of some great merger of this, all laced with the deepest respect for treating the living components that are out there with dignity and respect. You know, that's, that's one of the really interesting issues because what, what the word that we sometimes speak around is the issue of captivity. And in the context of there's nothing better than being there, one of the questions the market's asking us is, how about from the animal's perspective? Yeah. Is it better to be there in a tank or is it better to be there in the big blue? And I think that's one of the opportunities for technology. I, I know that some of the questions that Jeannie's asked are for the times that we can protect, the times that we can repair, there are species who, who, who thrive and do better and we protect in those environments. For those that maybe we're learning more about are less suited for that setting, how can we still provide an experience where they can be ambassadors for their species? And that might be an emerging role of technology. Can we create environments that are more naturalistic environments or even indeed natural environments that still permit access to those species in a way that's perhaps more appropriate, at least from a public perspective. And I think that's one of the really interesting questions that you've tried to address in the last few years. I think, yeah, 
How's that? No. Yes. Good. Okay. Um, I, I think it's it's true that the the generations that when we've seen the data, um, the the next generation, the millennials and and even like older than millennials, people are looking for um, leadership from zoos and aquaria to to tell them or to show them what to do politically, and so um, I'm so I'm not exactly responding to this this idea of the, the, the cetaceans and captivity, but, but they, they want to know what they can do to help protect these habitats and the ocean. And I, I would argue that zoos and aquarium of all organizations would be the best place to get that information. And I think from your studies, it shows that, that they are looking for that kind of information um, from zoos and aquaria. So, so um, I think it's it's appropriate, and probably the market is asking for it to to be steered that way, which is one of the things that Monterey Bay Aquarium does so well. Julie, you were trying to say. Well, I was going to pick up on uh, the conversation on, on this topic of technology, and it's such a fascinating one. And I'm sure many audience members are involved with museums, art museums. Um, and, and every museum, with the advent of the internet, everyone thought, oh gosh, we're gonna be out of business in a few years, this mm -hmm. is a disaster, everyone can stay at home and see our collections, and lo and behold, uh, museums are thriving in America more than ever before, and you know, we, we all could uh, opine on why, but I mean, one reason is, is gathering places and just such an important place for people to have some interaction with family and friends and kids and loved ones. I mean, this idea that Jeff brought up, I so agree with it. People love, actually our whole advertising campaign the past few years has been about this notion of that our audience loves the aquarium. I mean, they come to the aquarium, you love the aquarium, bring people you love. It's all about love and so, you know, you're absolutely right. But to the technology where, where I see it really playing a great role along with helping you interpret things that you could only do with digital technology as the plankton exhibit or a giant image of a seahorse giving birth or whatever, is how we can all use it to extend, to extend our reach. I mean, my view of the mission of our aquarium and what I think should be all of our missions uh, is to build a constituency for nature. You know, our mission clearly at Monterey is to build a constituency for the ocean. And so if, if you think of it and that case, you know, what goes on at your zoo or aquarium is just the start, it's just part of it, and as Jeff said so well, you're not going to change someone's mind or create lifelong values in a two-hour visit. If it's a local audience, maybe they'll come back frequently, and, and we all can remember, probably if there are nature huggers in the room like those up here, we all can remember either experiences outdoors or at a museum that shaped our love of nature today, but um, the power of of building and extending our reach through um, through social media, especially, is is amazing. And in Monterey, um, we've been working with Scott's team, sharing some data about the impact that's having. All the zoos and aquariums are really growing in that realm. And the idea being to engage people, you know, before, during, and after their visit, and help them engage with each other and start their own conversations and extend their learning in ways that go way, way beyond looking at the kelp forest at our exhibit or the lion exhibit, that is what is really exciting. I'm really excited about it, and especially because the whole millennial generation, you know, it's all about peer-to-peer -peer communication. You know, we can no longer be telling them what to think and do. They need to have peer endorsement, and um, it's, it's a new world, and it's really fascinating, and they're going, they're going to help us redefine what we're all about. I'm sure of that. I think just to add on to that, that you have facilities, you have buildings and spaces, um, and those are, buildings and spaces are also built for the people to have these social interactions, and if you could create more space within the facilities, I was recommending schools, but they could also be social spaces that allow people to have conversations uh, before or after they experience what they see in the exhibits, that's another way that you can um, extend your reach uh, that, that will allow these conversations to take place in, on site right after uh, or before or during seeing those amazing creatures. In a sense, we're talking truly uh, about 
a sense of crossroads. There, there are things that are kind of crossing at the time that we're speaking. I think I'd have been a thread of all the conversations we've been having here. One of them that really comes to me is what, Julie, you just mentioned, how do we build a constituency for the planet, for nature? Really, when you combine 180 million visits a year here in zoos and aquariums, more than all the four professional sports combined, almost a billion people visit zoos, aquariums, and botanic gardens around the planet every year. That is one out of seven almost people in the planet. How can we make that transfer? I, I know it's a love story, Jeff, you, you were mentioning, but how do we build that romance so that people really build a social movement? Really at this stage, we're, I think the target is how do we build those social spaces that are zoos and aquariums into a social movement that changes the world opinion about animals and the planet. And in a sense, this is kind of a general question, not an easy one, of course, but I would like to uh, explore that option. Yes, Sylvia. I want to comment on two quick things. One is to recognize one of my favorite parts of the Monterey Aquarium. It's where you invite people to <laughs> say what they think and make it available to put on a postcard an ability to connect with their representative or their senator or whatever. Uh, you're not telling them what to do, you're asking them. And that somehow it's engaging them and respecting their input. And it's the other not related thing directly is to, to get people to understand that every creature is an individual. And that if you can, and it doesn't sound very scientific, in fact, Jane Goodall got into a heap of trouble when she started naming the chimpanzees that she was studying. They were, she was told flat out that that's ter terribly unscientific. And you, it would lead to anthropomorphizing that, well, maybe they're, you know, suggesting that they're, they're like us. Well, duh. <laughs> <laughs> and if you, I mean, people do, if they can identify with an individual, whether it's narwhals trapped in a crack in the ice that motivate people to get out there and do something, or if, you know, imagine just giving fish in a tank names. In fact, some people behind the scenes do. There was Sydney, the Australian grouper that was at the aquarium, the Steinhardt Aquarium, for many years. Um, and it has, he has a personality. He was not like any other grouper they've ever had. And no other, you could say that about every human, every cat, every dog. It's true of every fish, it's true of every dolphin, every whale. But somehow getting people to care by associating with animals as individuals, whether they're elephants or, or birds, it, it somehow creates a different kind of feeling that kind of association, that love, if you will. And with the ability to connect the dots with knowledge, with information that you can use to influence the way things go, but also us with them as, uh, as individuals. I guess I, I have a couple thoughts on the, the building the global constituency. I mean, first of all, we read in the news all the time, I know Scott's data certainly would show this, the American public's interest in the environment right now, I won't call it at an all-time low, but it's definitely been bumping, it's gone down since like the 60s and 70s, and it's, I don't believe it's going up right now. Um, and uh, as the market research folks would tell us too, you know, it's all about what's going on with the economy, what's going on with global security, I mean, people are fickle. We have top priorities in our minds, and protecting uh, the, the thing that makes every other breath we take or some other you know, trivial thought like that, it's, it's, that's a long-term thing. It's not happening right now, and, and, and that's always been a challenge in the conservation movement. But uh, also, I have to say, for all the work that the environmental movement has 
you know, all the work they've done since, since the inception over just the past few decades, the American public, you know, there's not, it's not, it's not top of mind. But, you know, that being said, um, that even more is a reason why Susan Aquariums, you know, have such a critical role because you can bet that, that you know, hundreds of millions of visitors that have come through our places, I mean, not to say they're, they're you know, transformed into environmental, environmental advocates, they're not. It's a long journey of values creation and other life experiences and their educational settings and their home settings and myriad other things. But for sure, um, they're, you know, we're not going to make progress without providing those experiences. I think that's so important. I guess the other thing I just mentioned quickly is another kind of uh, sad uh, fact and figure is the tiny amount of United States charitable giving that goes to the environment. It's something I think like 3%, 3, 3 or 4%. So w when I think about the roles of zoos and aquariums as forces for conservation, forces for education, forces for constituency building, uh, forces to change kids' lives, uh, they would all, we would love to do all of that. But um, we, many of us are struggling with, um, you know, decaying infrastructure, needing to, you know, provide better environments for the animals under our care that will be with us for decades and decades. So, um, you know, part of, part of my mission for building a constituency is also building a constituency that's willing to support our organizations because with more resources, we, we know what to do, um, but it's, it's really a, a critical um, barrier. One of the wonderful things that are happening today is that this is live streaming and live tweeting, so we're getting questions from the blogosphere and the Twitter sphere. So uh, let, me, let me just throw a, a couple of them. Uh, some of them may be redundant. Um, we have a few minutes to go through that. But for example, how, um, how will our audiences or guests change as we move away from entertainment towards conservation? It should not be a, a <laughs> conflict. I mean, you can make, make it as enter what, What's more entertaining than, than the reality of something? I mean, so, simple thing, it shouldn't be either or. It's the genius of using the skills that we have to, uh, to entertain with the truth yes. and bring people along. I would, I would answer, um, do you remember that class where your teacher was really, really boring or do you remember that class where your teacher was really engaging and entertainment? Entertaining and that, that's the same one. Um, there are, uh, there is another question. What are the regulations of how aquariums uh, acquire aquatic animals? Uh, yeah. Well, we have rigorous standards uh, that we uh, adopt as part of our membership within the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Um, they have to do with our collection practices. They have to do with the habitats and the care that we're able to provide within our facilities. Uh, they're rigorously reviewed uh, and updated almost annually by our scientific peer community. Um, and, um, you know, they extend to, to really every creature within our care and our collection. And there are different standards for different species because obviously they require uh, different levels of care. Yes. Wonderful. Well, um, I'm sure we will continue this discussion both on the, on the internet and on the blogosphere and the interweb, as people say. Um, I'm really glad uh, to have had this opportunity with this amazing panel. I really want to thank all of you for your, for your contribution. I really have to say um, there is a lot of uh, attention being paid to this uh, panel from the zoo and aquarium world. Um, I think these are healthy discussions that need to happen more and more often. Uh, the zoo and aquarium world needs to both open but also at the same time try to answer some of these very challenging questions ahead of us. I really want to thank, of course, the Center for Humans and Nature and the South Carolina Aquarium for this incredible opportunity. Thank you everybody for hosting.
啊。